Yo, Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be looking at the Dragon King's Cragblade, and this is a weapon that I kind of avoided for a little while just because I thought it was a little bit meme and didn't think it would be that good, but it actually has really, really high damage, the range is insane, and the Ash of War I've found to be actually quite consistent. So, especially the Uncharged version, we'll go into detail about how to land the Ash of War very consistently for just massive damage, um, and yeah, this is just an overall great weapon that I kind of slept on for a while. So, we're going to be running this on just a pure dexterity build, 55 dex, but if we want to run Millicent's Prosthesis, we can hit the 60 dex soft cap. So so it's not a bad place to be. And then we also have the Claw Talisman for jumping attacks, but running something like the Shard of Alexander as well as Millicent's Prosthesis could be a good way to go, especially if you're going to be going for a lot of the L1 moveset. So we'll discuss, you know, how the L1 moveset figures into this versus the two-handed moveset. We'll be running both, um, but let's go ahead and jump into the invasions. As always, if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing, I'd appreciate it. But yeah, let's get into it. All right, so this first invasion is going to be in Landell, and we have a very aggressive phantom, so we're going to go ahead and buff while they wiggle their weapon at us, and their aggression doesn't really pay off as they munch down on a series of light attacks with the two-handed moveset, and the two-handed moveset is amazing for just catching players multiple times in a row. If they don't roll out and just kind of back off, oftentimes you'll be able to hit them, you know, two or three times, and especially if their poise is low, you'll poise break them every single time, and that can just bait another roll that will uh, oftentimes result in a roll catch. So we've been able to eliminate one player very quickly with Reign of Arrows since they were just kind of standing off in the back. And here we begin chasing down this aggressive phantom with the Power Stance moveset. So we can kind of get a feel for when it's useful, when it's not. I find the neutral light attacks to be quite bad when it comes to tracking and much prefer the two-handed moveset. But we do go ahead and go for the fully charged version of our Ash of War and actually do complete the chase down with it. So I would say the fully charged version is a bit inconsistent, but by no means bad, and if your opponent doesn't time their rolls well, then you will be able to actually successfully land a bunch of damage that will usually do, uh, you know, somewhere between a third of your opponent's health and half, so uh, really quite useful there. And here we're having a hard time chasing down this player, uh, so we do switch over to the Misericord with Thunderbolt on it, and it looks like they were working on disconnecting to us, but instead they get hit with a Thunderbolt, and we do come out with the victory. So next up we're going to have a really good example of just how to zone and isolate your opponents, especially when there's not much room to maneuver. So we're going to be focusing primarily on that little doorway that I jumped through just there, uh, especially once we notice that that door is closed and we have to deal with Blood Blade. Uh, it just doesn't give us a lot of room to maneuver, so instead we're gonna kind of block this exit with a Sleep Pot, hope our opponents are aggressive, which they are, and that allows us to isolate this player with the Great Shield uh, for long enough to get them down to very low health. And then again, that soft swap over to the Misery Accord is super nice to land a Thunderbolt as they think they're out of range and potentially they go for a heal and now what the uh the plan is is basically to just do the same thing we did last time since it seemed to work however we did not get the sleep to connect here we are using the power stance move set a little bit and again our opponent is low we don't know if they're going to run away so rather than going for a chase down we'll just opt for the thunderbolt they stayed aggressive but if they had been running away it would have been nice to just kind of use that ash of war from a distance and get some more damage um, here we see that our opponent is turtling a little bit with their shield so we're going to use the mace talisman to just see if we can get a little bit more stamina damage with our attacks however it doesn't prove to be necessary we whiff a backstab grab but they do accidentally roll into the uh just kind of regular attack and we're able to come out with the victory um, this next one is going to be just a great example of using the ravioli step or the back step move set with the power stance weapon. So here uh, we'll just take care of an opponent real quick with the thunderbolt and we'll begin using the back step attacks which just come out for so much damage with the L1. So here we get a ravioli step that just does a great job of roll catching our opponent and finishes them off extremely quickly. Um, here this player does not have very much health so it's not too much of an issue but we can straight up chase them down with ravioli steps just because of the long range and finish off our opponent there. So I would say try to use that backstep attack as much as you can. Um, obviously backstep attacks are kind of hard to land but using it in the ravioli format is going to be helpful and if you get the L1 to connect it's going to do 
massive damage, um, similar to how a power stance greatsword moveset works where that back step does come out as a poke. Uh, the main difference here is that you have a significantly longer range with that back step. So moving on, we're going to um, quickly eliminate this player here using the Vikes Ash of War. Um, however, a, another Phantom does come in pretty quickly. We're going to go ahead and throw a Frost Pot and just get the Frostbite build up on this Phantom. And we're going to wait for this PvE to just kind of wander in. Um, as it meanders at the uh, Phantom here, we are going to be able to just kind of get some time alone with the Phantom, which is really nice. Uh, this is a great way to isolate your opponent when uh, PvE just comes in to distract the host. and again, the soft swap over to Thunderbolt is able to just kind of finish off what we needed. Um, here we go for Ravioli Step and get the guard break and then finish our opponent off with the soft swap. So really, I just can't praise enough how useful Thunderbolt is as an Ash of War on a soft swap Misa Record. Like it can be nice to have VHS, but really the soft swap has uh, just kind of turned a difficult multi-opponent situation into a one-on-one -on -one. Um, so effectively. I am just a, a huge fan of it. Um, <laughs> moving on, we can see the Ash of War just kind of putting in work. And this is an opponent that was kind of swinging wildly, so I began to go for some fishing. Um, we try to line up some backstab fishing, but it's not quite working. Um, I'm just not able to get the, the right positioning. Here, I think we were in the best spot that we could, but uh, the latency wasn't really in our favor. We were a little too slow, um, and we don't actually get the successful backstab. And here, we just decide, um, you know, what's better than a backstab is going to be a parry. Um, and so we bait an attack with a just regular hit, go for the hard swap over to the Miser Accord, and successfully finish this opponent. So um, I do want to say, just, you know, with the soft swapping over to the Miser Accord with Thunderbolt, like, the HTS is amazing for chase downs, but um, I just think, it, like, kind of why make your life difficult with needing to travel and catch up with your opponent and potentially get stunned in those moments. So I hope uh, y'all don't feel like it's kind of a cop-out to be using that to finish kills, but I really just do think it's extremely effective. Um, this next one is going to be a 2v1, and... I found that this was probably the best demonstration of how to effectively use an HTS in a 2v1. Um, kind of like the most correctly I felt like I did throughout this showcase. So really, I think I did a good job here of you know, not being too aggressive, really maintaining my priority when I could and backing off when I needed to escape. Here we get the jumping L1 and poise break our opponent out of an attack uh, with a colossal sword. So the jumping L1 is going to be one of the few parts of the move set that will actually break their poise. Um, and here we begin to aggress with the running heavy. Um, I really do recommend the running heavy over the running L1 in most cases. You'll see me try to use it periodically, but uh, to very little success. I think it can be a good way to surprise your opponent if you've conditioned them with a running heavy or a series of running heavies, but typically I found the running L1 to just be difficult to land um, and pretty reactable for my opponents. So if it was an opponent that didn't know where I was or, you know, I was kind of getting the jump on them, the running L1 would be great. But uh, really the running heavy is just, you know, used so frequently for a good reason. So here we pull out the funny Ash of War and we get a decent amount of damage. Then rather than trying to, again, get the chase down with an HTS, we just go for a couple quick swings with the Miser Accord and turn this into a one-on-one. -on -one. And this player definitely played well, but I think they were having a little bit of difficulty with just kind of the variation of the moveset of both the two-handed uh, heavy thrusting sword and the power stance. Um, here they did a good job of getting out of that plunging attack, and they do have some PvE just kind of creeping up on them, which is making our lives a little bit easier. Here we get a nice roll catch with the running heavy attack. Again, uh, not going for the running L1, and we get the running heavy to connect again. Um, and you'll see me in just a moment go for some running L1s in there. Um, you can just see how slow and reactable it is. It's just not great. Um, so I was trying to condition my opponent, but they were still able to just, you know, pretty comfortably react to it. So uh, running L1, not, not a good really move to be using. Um, so we're switching back to a little bit more of the R1s and the heavy attacks. But here we again go for a 
fairly consistent finish. You know, uh, I didn't miss either of the two that I went for with that Ash of War, um, and it just did a lot of damage and, you know, was a great finish in that moment. So next up we have uh, what starts as a 2v1 with a very aggressive host running Power Stance Curve Swords. Um, their aggression is just problematic, and so we go ahead and catch one player for a Stormhawk Axe, followed up by a boulder for the finish, which was pretty awesome to see. Um, now this host is pretty smart in backing off. Using the boulders to our advantage is pretty ideal for us, and especially if we're backing down that ramp, it means that our opponents are going to not see the boulder behind them and we will get visibility on the boulder and that's going to be a big advantage for us in terms of our placement uh, and just like how we time our rolls and uh, the boulders I think are very much on our side when we're the ones facing them. So uh, this host does turn this into just kind of one-on-one -on -one and they're doing a good job of avoiding the HTS, also throwing out some storm blades to potentially punish our um, just neutral game a little bit. We get them very close to death here and we go for a Misericord um, soft swap to Thunderbolt, but they're doing a good job of reaction rolling that. And at this point, the Hunter does come in and just kind of start blasting away with the Dula's Moonblade and we need to back off. So here we're gonna go ahead and switch over to the Power Stance moveset and bait them back towards the boulders. We know that that's been a useful tactic previously. So we want to not really be crushed with the pressure of running L1s mixed with the uh, just kind of magic attacks coming from the Hunter. And so we're really gonna back off here. And the Hunters are oftentimes a little bit more aggressive than the host might be. They just come in with a job and don't really care if they die. Um, so that's been experience, my experience sometimes and we can see the boulder just, you know, really putting on additional pressure and we try to grab a backstab with the Misericord. Instead, we get the finish with the Thunderbolt and here another blue comes in and this just kind of cracked me up. They jump and immediately get one-shotted by the boulder. Um, so really shout out to the boulders. They uh, know what's up and just do a great job of helping us out. Now, we do try to catch up to the host, however, they go up the lift. We're going to go ahead and just bring that lift back down to us and try to set ourselves up to be in a good position. So we want a Golden Parry Parry Shield, just because we know that they're going to be going for running attacks with the Power Stance Curve Swords, and we eat a little crab, and on our way up, they kind of predictably fall out of Guala. So um, just kind of a fun, uh, I guess it was ultimately 4v1. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't get the finish on the host, but a fog wall is just as good in many cases. So now we have a couple players that look like they might fog wall us, but instead they are hungry to defeat the invader. Um, so that's great for us. We're going to go ahead and use that Thunderbolt to get the last two bits of HP. Um, that works out great for us, and we switch back over to the Power Stance moveset of the... Dragon King's Cragblade. Now, this was a, a little bit funny to just kind of be avoiding these giant gravity attacks from the host. Uh, we're trying not to get too greedy, we're just kind of taking our time and looking for different openings. We can get real aggressive on this Phantom real quick and just kind of avoid their uh, Ash of War. However, they do get a crouching attack that does a decent amount of damage. I feel like potentially they could have done more. Um, just those crouching attacks, especially with the Uchi Katanas, just are very, very strong. And here we actually get a running L1 and we can see what type of damage that does, close to 800, uh, which is awesome to see. And we get them very, very low. Again, soft swap over to the Misericord, looking for the Thunderbolt. However, uh, we do get broken out of that by the host. So we do need to back off and just kind of reset to neutral here and try to get our health topped off. And we're gonna see if we can get a little bit of damage with the freezing pot and also get them frostbitten. We don't land the freezing pot and need to switch our focus over to the host as they go for a dragon incantation. We just like to knock them out of that if we can. Um, and here we get a bit of damage with a running heavy and then followed up with just a couple swings from the Misericord. So such a good finisher, really a uh, champion of this <laughs> showcase. Um, I could definitely be getting finishes with the Dragon King's Crag Blade, but I just, you know, I, I found it to be um, a little bit slower and a less, a little bit less consistent. So um, we're going to be moving on to a 3v1, and this is going to um, be, <laughs> you know, kind of spammy. Definitely we'll see some, uh, uh, like, pre-buffing from the 
player that's casting some incantations, uh, definitely set up on kind of a faithy build. So we're going to want to eliminate them first, especially because we don't know if they're going to be casting heals that will heal everyone involved. Um, so they fall pretty quickly to a combination of the PvE and my Ash of War, and then we're going to set our eyes on this player with the Cross Naginatas. Now, fortunately, the PvE in this area are doing a bunch of damage. Um, here we have a really clutch moment where we see that they pull out a buckler, so we just kind of switch our movement so that we totally avoid, um, you know, the possibility of getting parried in that moment. So if you can, you know, kind of have the heads up uh, play to just you know, free aim your attack and have it not go directly into the parry shield that can save you from a uh, high damage repost. And here we get uh, about 430 damage on the Phantom, but do need to back off. We really need to respect the blood loss buildup that comes with Power Stance Cross Naginatas. Um, here we get a nice kind of uh, free aim jumping attack. And now we know that we have um, some attacks that are going to be faster than the parry that they're going for. And so we're able to just deliver a couple light attacks before they can even get a parry off. And we are successful there. Now this host was um, doing a weird amount of damage with some of their attacks. Uh, I would say the blood loss is the biggest concern, especially on the dagger. And so we were having a, a little bit of difficulty just kind of avoiding that blood loss and also maintaining priority. Um, mostly when they were using the dagger, pretty much every other weapon we were doing okay with. Uh, but a blue has come into the world and they've definitely found their L2 button and are just really enjoying applying pressure to it. So we're going to see a lot of the Glintstone Pebbles coming out from their <laughs> curve sword. Uh, so a little bit unorthodox, but we do deliver about 700 damage with a series of light attacks. And here we get a jumping attack followed up by just a quick swing with the Miser Accord and get the finish there. Now we do see Storm Caller from the host, so we're gonna really wanna back off on that. We don't really have a great way to punish that. Potentially the Uncharged Ash of War would be fast enough and give us enough hyper armor to get in there and do a lot of damage, uh, but we just kinda opt to reset instead. And here we do see the power of the dagger with blood loss buildup on it. Uh, they're able to get a decent amount of damage on us and we again need to just kinda back off and heal and try to set ourselves up for um, just some of the HTS attacks. We were hoping to land the L2 there, or the L1 with the jumping attack, however they were still in iframes from the Bloody Gila, so um, again we kind of lose out on that trade and now need to focus our attention on the blue here. And the blue is going to be running Vike Spear, so we want to make sure our madness is pretty low, um, and just if we have the space to use a bolus, I definitely recommend it. And we're going to be, you know, seeing the uh, Buckler Parry, you know, in the mix, and so going for a few more jumping attacks whenever that parry shield is out. You really don't want to get hit with the repost. And now the blue has also pulled out a parry shield. So switching over to the two-handed moveset is ideal in this situation just because the jumping attacks are a little bit more consistent and a little bit easier to free aim. So here we can see that free aim jumping attack uh, catching that blue and the tried and true Muser Accord swap as an Estus punish works out quite well and we are able to eliminate that blue as well. So Back to a one-on-one -on -one with the host, we've defeated the kind of normal four players that can come in for this invasion, two blues and two phantoms, um, and now it's really just up to us to uh, finish off this host. We have a decent amount of health, and we're trying to respect their dagger. We don't get hit with the blood loss, but instead we roll out before they can hit us for like a third or fourth time, and just heal that blood loss buildup. They go for some of their blue flask, we hit them twice, we throw out a couple parries, not sure if they're going to be going for the offhand dagger, because we do notice that they do like to match with that and we're going to be switching over to the two-handed moveset hoping to potentially get some jumping attacks or running attacks um, you know with the the whip out we can't parry that so we're just kind of cognizant there but if we think they're going to mash with the dagger we can go for a nice carry and retaliation parry um, and finish them off potentially like that here we do get a nice ravioli step and we just pop off one more light attack for the finish and come out with the victory uh, against uh, five players in total so definitely nice and that's going to conclude the the invasion portion of the showcase. We do see uh, a little bit of just amazing code uh, working the way you would hope it would. Uh, good latency, good everything, uh, good desync. The duel portion for the showcase is going to be a little bit different. We're going to have a couple duels against some players that I've learned a lot from and really looked up to over the past 
uh, I guess two years it's been now. And the first is going to be up against Stielowski. So we're going to have two duels with Stielowski. The first time I'm going to be running Shamshir, but I will be switching over to the Heavy Thrusting Sword. So uh, it's just going to be a little bit of a mix. Shamshir is kind of nice to go up against the Power Stance Lances just because you get um, kind of good get in, get out opportunities where you can get some damage in. Um, you'll see that I'm playing fairly passively, fairly defensively because the Vortex potential that comes with PSGS is pretty massive and I really uh, you know, want to play this well, kind of put my best foot forward. So we do get the swap over to the HTS. We get hit with Storm Assault, uh, but not the full damage, just kind of the wind damage. So that's pretty huge for not uh, <laughs> losing this immediately. We try to get a read on their attack, but we do get hit with a jumping light attack. And Steel goes for the customary chainsaw attempt at the end of that duel. So I did queue up immediately after and was lucky enough to have another opportunity. And this time we are going to be again swapping between the Shamshir and the HTS and Steel is somebody that is in Europe, so we're going to have to look out again for a little bit of latency between our two connections. Uh, it's just due to the ocean between us, and um, I'm able to get some good damage in real quick with a couple just light attacks with the Shamshir, and we are again playing fairly patiently. I have a little bit more of a confidence boost now that my health advantage is showing, uh, but we don't want to rush in too aggressively and get Vortex again. That's really kind of on our mind. We also know that Steel had Storm Assault, so that's something to very much look for, out for. Um, so Steel's doing a good job of switching between the Power Stance and Two-Handed Moveset. We're going to come in with a light attack, but we're not really, you know, getting too much damage. Um, we're having a hard time getting things to connect, and we don't want to overcommit to anything. Um, a good way to rush in can be the HTS running heavy. Unfortunately, Steel is very much out of range for that, so we're going to switch back to the Shamshir real quick and just continue with our footsies, trying to look for different opportunities. The jumping attack can potentially lead to a good opportunity there, but Steel is able to get in and out pretty effectively there. So I need to be playing this latency a little bit better. I think I was attacking more to where they were and I need to be attacking kind of like where you think they're going to be. Um, so I swap over that HTS, get punished for that running attack. Steel does a good job of starting a vortex. And here we get a jumping attack. They go for storm assault and we actually get a roll in backstab on that. So uh, a very risky play, uh, kind of a funny way to finish it, but we do get the GG's and then just go for the chainsaw attempt as uh, kind of a meme. So next up we have Nightlord and this is a player that I've done a a lot of fight clubs with I really enjoy playing against them they're definitely better than me but um, anytime I get a win against them it just feels really really nice and uh, it's just kind of fun to go up against a really good player with something like uh, HTS especially this one which does have some tricks off its sleeve that we'll kind of see later on in this duel so we get a nice read on uh, their light attack and kind of punish it with a jumping heavy and that does a decent amount of damage and now Nightlord is in a fairly low health range and they're particularly deadly at this low health range when they've got their feathers on as well as the ability to swap to royal remains they can play a little bit more passively. Fortunately the HTS is good for being like pretty aggressive um, and its low recovery time can be pretty helpful for punishing um, just kind of passive play. And here we go for the tried and true Ash of War. So we trade into it, we see that we have enough room on our blood meter to not get bled out of it, and we're able to effectively defeat Night Lord. So that was a huge win for me, um, and just something that I was very excited about. Uh, next up we have Cat7 Vaughn. So this is a player I've probably played with more than almost any other player, um, and they've just kind of leveled up very consistently in Elden Ring over I don't know, the past two years and uh, have just gotten extremely good. They've won a tournament, um, they have amazing fundamentals, and uh, they're just somebody that I can learn a lot from, along with all these players, but uh, I'm going up against them with the HTS, and they know that I like to go for the L2, so they're very conscientious to not mash into it too hard and kind of maintain their priority, but also respect the fact that I have this kind of trade button. Fortunately, when we get guard broken, they're not able to actually uh, punish it with a repost, and here we do get a frame with the L2, so even a player that knows that I like to use that L2 button on this weapon um, still has a hard time avoiding it, and I I think that kind of just speaks to the utility of the uh, L2 on the 
Dragon King's Crag Blade. So next up we have a player that again goes for a, a parry and we are able to quickly punish that with the L2 button. And so this was just kind of a random duel. I don't actually know that player, um, but I did want to include it. Just kind of the effectiveness of that Ash of War is, is quite powerful. Um, and lastly, we are going to have just a duel with a, a really nice finish. Um, this is one, I believe this is a person cosplaying an NPC from Dark Souls 3. So kind of fun you don't really see the alabaster crossbow in game too much but they've got a curved greatsword which is you know not too too shabby the hyper armor is quite strong and we're just trying to avoid their sword dance and try to find opportunities with jumping attacks i find that if you go for a jumping attack and you follow it up with a light attack a lot of times you can catch your opponent especially with the range on this weapon and we're going to go ahead and just get a couple pokes in and we've gotten them to decently low health they do get their crossbow shot off but as they go to reload uh, they're not able to get it in time and here we get a phenomenal back stab where we catch their roll and backstab them off a cliff so uh, that one was super fun and yeah that's all I've got for the showcase I hope you enjoyed it and if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing I would always appreciate that but yeah take care